Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, a show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, your best friend, and I'm happy to be here today. On the show today, we are going to talk about... Uh, all kinds of fun. First up, we're going to talk about a, a book that John King has reviewed. Then we're going to jump into the Lucky Fishing uh, Contest for our St. Patrick's Day uh, contest. And of course, we're going to do the news. And so we're going to jump right in. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. All right, in Fish in the News. We have Fishing Presents a Vexing Snag in Brexit Talks. This is from the New York Times. And the headline reads, Brexin, Brixham, England, in the pitch black of early morning, huge waves hurled the 30-ton vessel from side to side, drenching crewmen who struggled to keep their footing as they cast trawler nets into the swirling seas. But once back on the bridge, the skipper, Dave Driver, was oblivious to the stomach-churning motion of the boat and dismissive of the perils of his work, even as he recalled uh, once falling overboard on occasion, rescuing two fishermen from drowning. I'm my own boss. I do what I want. I think it's best job in the world, said Mr. Driver, who left school at age 15, but now owns the girl Deborah, which is worth 1.2 million pounds. He has only one major gripe in life, the French. (laughs) The French. Uh, Mr. Driver thinks French boats are allowed to take too many fish too close to the British coast, touching on a deeply emotional issue on both sides of the channel that could dash hopes of post-Brexit trade deal between Britain and the European Union, the French. Without the obligations and membership of the bloc, Britain wants to curb the number of continental trawlers in its water. It even... It is even scaling up its naval protection fleet in preparation to possible confrontage on the high confronti- confrontations. I cannot read on the high seas. So the French are causing troubles with Brexit. Interesting. Uh, yet it's the fishermen. That, yet it's the fishermen that rely on European markets where new trade barriers look certain. And if talks collapse, many fear that France's famously truculent fishermen could blockade ports to stop movement of British fish. And so this is all about like who gets to control the market. Now, most of the fish they're catching in England and shipping overseas are uh, are mackerel and herring, and they're mostly not consumed in England. They are consumed, uh, they say overseas, but like we're we're going shipping to China. We're shipping. They're shipping to. Um, Japan and other countries that eat a lot of that kind of uh, f- more flavorful fish than uh, those white European English like to eat. They're really into the cod and uh, white fishes there. So it's really a battle over that. And we'll see how that plays out with Brexit uh, interrupting the fishing market. You never know like how important the fishing world is to everything else. So that's our first news story. Next up in the news, this is a local story from Pennsylvania submitted from one of our listeners. Uh, cor- coronavirus leads to changes in 2020 Pennsylvania trout season, and this is what you need to know about it. Uh, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission has changed plans for stocking trout and the, it is fast approaching 2020 trout season because of guidelines on large gatherings and the coronavirus, according to the report from Penn Live. Those changes, which are effective immediately, include consolidating the 2020 trout season into a single statewide schedule for all Pennsylvania counties, accelerating trout stocking operations, and limiting volunteer particip- particip- participation. The statewide opening date for trout it will be April 18th. There will be no regional opener two weeks earlier. There will also be uh, mentored youth day on April 11th. So what they're doing is they're, instead of having multiple uh, days of starting, they are starting all at once. It used to be like early you could start and then two weeks later another season opens. And so a lot of uh, fishermen in Pennsylvania right now are really upset because they were ready to fish this week. And now uh, I think one of our listeners, Carl Hay, sent this in. Uh, they now have to wait two more weeks before they can start fishing, which is interesting because, if I can find this story real quick, Maine did the opposite. Uh, Let me find their story. This is from WABI5. Governor Maine 
Governor, <laughs> Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Open Inland Recreational Fishing. From Augusta, Maine, statement from Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife to, to encourage Mainers to enjoy their outdoor resources and to support a happy, healthy Maine. Governor Mills and the Commissioner Camuso are enacting the following changes effectively immediately. Any person, except those whose license has been suspended or revoked, may fish without a license uh, through April 30th, 2020. This change does not apply to activities which require a commercial freshwater permit. All inland waters that traditionally open water fishing on April 1st will now be open uh, to all fishing effective right now, which is really cool because with with the coronavirus, people are being told you know, to, to separate from other people and they're staying indoors and outdoors is open and Maine wants people outside enjoying it. I, I, I want to see New Hampshire and other states like Minnesota follow suit so more people can get outside and enjoy um, enjoy the recreation because you can do these recreational activities and maintain that social distance from other people without any kind of problem whatsoever. So um, good job on Maine. Good jo- good on you, Maine. And, and Pennsylvania, what the hell? Why not just make it all earlier? Um, I know they're doing that because they have to stock the fish, and because, I'm sure it has to do with their there are no, no more volunteers in Pennsylvania. So now regular people have to do the fish stocking, regular people being fish and game officers. So it takes a little bit longer. Um, but that's some fish in the news. I think we could do one more story for you here. And this is one I really like, and this is from England. From the Guardian, return of the burbot, great lost fish to be reintroduced to the UK. Freshwater predatory cod species to make comeback after 50 years of absence. 50 years of absence. Forget dreams of wolves, bears, or lynx. The next animal to be restored to the British countryside could be a river bottom dwelling fish that resembles a giant tadpole. The burbot, much maligned for its un unrepossessing appearance with a fleshy appendage dangling from his chin called a barbell was last sighted in British rivers in 1969. I probably was a summer of love. It got, you know, went off to Woodstock and never came home. A reward for, uh, <laughs> a reward for spotting it remains unclaimed. And now a costed reintroduction plan is being drawn up for natural England. The government's conservation watchdog. This is a quote. To chan- the chance to bring back burbot to our rivers is hugely exciting, said Jonah Tosney, Operations Director of the Norfolk Rivers Trust, which is m- masterminding the reintroduction plan. Unlike beavers, lynx, and sea eagles, they haven't been gone for long, only about 50 years. Anglers still recall catching them. We're hopeful that recent work to improve their water quality and restore their habitat has brought our rivers back to good enough state to support English lo- Eng- England's lost fish. The burbot, also known as the eel pout or lingcod or uh, burbot, we said burbot already, um, Loda Loda is its Latin name, disappeared at the same time as the otter vanished from the waterways. In both cases, agriculture and heavy metal pollution may have played a role. Uh, Tosney said the cause of the burbot's disappearance remained a bit of a mystery. It was a combination of pressures, including the disappearance of natural messy edges of rivers, including pools and flooded areas and back channels. People did used to eat them, but it's more likely to be water quality and habitat degradation uh, that caused them to disappear. The burbot is the only freshwater species of cod. It once thrived at the bottom of the cool lowland rivers across eastern England, but leaves its preferred habitat for ponds and pools to spawn, so it requires pools and other freshwater close to the river. The burbot, burbot could also be a beneficial to beaver reintroductions as beavers create burbot-friendly habitat. The fish has been successfully reintroduced in Belgium and Germany, and Tosney said there were several rivers in eastern Anglian fens with good floodplains that could be ideal habitat. So this is interesting to me because I always thought of burbot as being a uh, as being a super cold water fish, like deep glacial lakes, not river habit fish. So I'd be really curious what their behaviors are in England. Like in the United States, we think of them as um, uh, as, ha- as summer hibernators. And in summertime, they barely move at all. They just kind of dig down the mud and, and never move. But I'm curious about their river behavior. I, I never hear about them being caught in rivers. I'd love to chat with someone who burbot fishes in England. If you have, give me a call, 607 378 fish and uh, maybe I'll get you on the show and we can talk more about burbots. And that is Fish in the News. News, news, fish in the news. Everybody loves their fish in the news. 
Hey everybody, it's Crappie Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas, and I'm here with a book review for you. Earlier I turned in a story about this pro basser named Mike Long who was exposed as a cheater and a phony after a two-year investigation of the San Diego pro bass fishing scene. This brought to mind a book that my good friend Chaz Stevens of Louisville, Kentucky recommended to me a while back. Now, we've been staying with Chaz and his lovely wife in their B&B for several years and have become friends, and when he found out I fished, he fervently suggested I read Double Whammy by Carl Hyasson. But you all know how it goes. I didn't get around to it, didn't get around to it, didn't feel like I had a chance. But when the Mike Long story surfaced, I knew now was the time. But before I go on, first a PSA about littering brought to you by Fish Nerds Guide Service. The following public service announcement is brought to you by Fish Nerds Guide Service. My biggest fishing pet peeve is trash. Uh, we got the people who carry all their stuff down to the stream bank or river bank or lake bank to fish and then leave all their crap there. Come on, guys, we're better than this. And I hate it. Hate it, hate it. And like bait boxes or fishing line or old hooks or soft plastics. Let's clean up after ourselves. The people leaving trash and their fishing line and you definitely know their anglers take your trash with you and i hate it hate it hate it beer cans and fishing line i have no time for these people fish nerds guide service kindly reminds you to fish responsibly if you can carry it in please carry it out and leave no trace and be a fish nerd and love the resource with all your heart now back to our program all right, we're back. Let me tell you, I'm so glad I finally took the time to read this book. Carl Hiasen is well known in Pulp Fiction circles and has a great following among detective novel enthusiasts, a paperback writer worthy of the song. Naturally, I do not want to spoil things, but here are some of the bare bones. It is a story about bass tournament fishing and the relentless rivalries therein, a world where cheating, unfortunately, is not uncommon and the competition for the money is fierce. Private investigator R.J. Decker is hired to photograph one of the cheaters in the act and ends up embroiled in a case where cheating is only the beginning. My favorite things about the book run in two main channels. On one hand, it is pulp fiction extraordinaire. It has several elements that read like they've been lifted from a cable version of that good old 70s detective show, Rockford Files. Like Jim Rockford, R.J. Decker is an ex-con who was wrongly convicted, he possesses a laundry list of wry tricks to escape trouble, has a best friend uh, who is a cop, and he even lives in a trailer. However, the sex and violence in the book is amped up times 10. Well, does it go all the way to 11? Making for a bloody, raw story covered in grit. The cast of characters is true to form, with an evangelist, a sugar baron, a swarm of 101 bubbas, a couple of unlikely heroes, and it peaks with a burned-out hippie swamper that lives on roadkill. Pure southern comfort all the way. And yes, Paul Chomo, it is set in Florida. What is most germane to the Mike Long expose are the points where truth and fiction come together. Double Whammy was written in 1987, at a time when power fishing became a term, and tournament fishing was exploding in terms of popularity and prize money. The parallels between what the cheater in the book does and what Mike Long did are very compelling. Although there is no snagging of bedded bass in Double Whammy, the use of tanks, cages, and live transport to move fish from one lake to another to create an illusion of prowess and success is the same in both stories, fiction and non. For me, the most profound similarity between the book and the expose is that, like Mike Long, the big phony in Double Whammy is able to cover up any suspicions behind a cloak of popularity. It is the cult of personality that develops around these guys with their notoriety that allows these sorts to appear as anglers of skill whose behavior is beyond reproach. In Double Whammy, the fake has a TV show while Mike Long used a combination of local media and a great deal of social, social media, especially YouTube, to solidify his reputation. Thus, when anglers mutter among themselves that the bass put on the scale are the wrong color for the condition at the tournament lake, they are dismissed as bad sports or envious grumblers of little talent. In both the book and the expose, bass are transported in order to run a con. In both, no one wants to be the one to blow the whistle for fear it won't do any good. 
However, in double whammy, bass fraud is used to create a con far larger than winning a tournament purse. But there, I will say no more. Read the book and see. And now here's Crappy Hippie with a few words about the Fish Nerds Facebook group. Wait, man, I, um, you're you're like you're Crappy Hippie. I know I'm Crappy Hippie. Well, you, you sound like you're trying to be like two people. Look, can you pay me out a little slack here? I was just getting into podcasting. It's not the best transition. It's you know, but you. Like you're you're acting like you know it's like crappie hippie bringing you crappie hippie. You're, you're acting like two people. What what like 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 what we're doing right now? Yeah, I I mean you know I mean right. Well, okay, I'm bipolar. You're the one side. I'm the other side. I did my best. It was you know I was just getting started. Okay, it's a clumsy transition, but it's all I got. I want to get this show out. Uh, okay, man, you, you know, you're, you're freaking out. I know I'm freaking out, and, and you're not, you know, helping. Um, I'm sorry. Anyway, the Face Nerds, the Face Nerds, yes, the Face Nerds Fishbook group. The Fish Nerds Facebook group, everybody, enjoy. Hey, this is Crappie Hippie. You want to hang out with Fish Nerds online? Join us on our Facebook page by signing up for the Fish Nerds podcast group. Fish pictures, fishy news and stories, and good fish-oriented humor are all things we invite you to read and or post. And don't miss out on the Friday Fish Poll, where we ask you your experiences, insights, or position on this and that in the world of fish, fishing, and eating fish. Come on and join us and have some fun on the Fish Nerds Podcast Group on Facebook. And now, back to the review. No, Double Whammy is not brilliant. There are some minor plot holes and a plot element or two that are bound to elicit an eye roll. What it is, however, is a whole lot of grown-up fun and gives the non-fisher a quick glimpse into the world that they may never experience otherwise. Then the plot soon spirals off the edge of the reality map and into a swamp land of greed and evil, quickly encasing the reader in a bubble of belief whereupon it becomes a rocket ride where a crash seems imminent at every twist and turn. So go find yourself a copy of Carl Hyacin's Double Whammy in the paperback section and take a little trip through Pro Bassin in Florida, Pulp Fiction style. This has been Crappie Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas saying tight lines and valentines. Peace out. At Olukai, we handcraft Hawaiian-inspired footwear, finding inspiration in Hawaiian culture and craftsmanship. Fishing is at the heart of Hawaiian culture today, just as it's been for centuries. Generations of fishermen and women expertly cast from rocky shorelines and sandy beaches. They spearfish, throw nets, fly fish, and navigate their boats beyond the reef and into the deep blue in search of the next big catch. No matter how they do it, there's an attention to detail and respect for the ocean that guides their passion. At Alukai, they have bo- they believe in the same attention to detail when crafting the highest quality shoes and sandals built for every type of marine environment. Alukai's water-friendly Nohia Moku slip-on shoe features razors sipping with non-marking rubber for extra grip on the deck, dock, and rocks and designed for easy on-off barefoot wear. Now, I've been wearing these shoes for about three weeks now, and I've been wearing them in the snow and ice, and they're not made for that, but I still love them so much, and I really appreciate Alukai sending me and my wife Kristen some of these shoes. And when it comes to sandals that perform, Alukai's new Ulele provides the comfort and durability of a sneaker for those long days on the boat or on the shore. And uh, they sent me a pair of those too, really nice looking flippity flops, and uh, they float, which is magical. I think everything fishing world should float. I can't believe other businesses haven't figured that part out. Uh, anyway, you can go to olukai.com slash fish nerds to find out more. O L U K A I dot com slash fish nerds and really appreciate their sponsorship because right now, real money makes a real difference for this podcast. So thank you. Uh, for sponsoring this. All right. So with last month, we've been doing our luckiest fishing contest for the month of March. So that's all wrapped up. People called our hotline 607-378-FISH and we have our entry. So take a listen and you just think about which one's your favorite. And at the end, I will announce the winner of this month's fishing question of the of the month question of the i can't say it question of the month enjoy 
This is Tim Beat from Ohio. Hey, My Tim. luckiest fishing day was fishing from the shore for stripers in Maine. It's always good. I was crossing some rock that was exposed at low tide, and I saw something shiny in the rocks. Ooh, it was a GoPro camera case with a camera inside, and the case was rusty, but it was still intact. So when I got home, I pried the case open and discovered the camera was fine, and I took the video off the memory card and found four hours of video, most of which was audio from the ocean floor. Mm -hmm. The video opened with some guys in a house trying to figure out how to use the GoPro. They were about to go kayaking in the ocean and they're talking on the phone to the guy they borrowed the camera from. Hey, I was asking how to use the GoPro, but I think I got it going. It's, it's definitely recording right now. One of the guys even brags to the guy on the phone that they'll take better videos than he does. Because we may take a better video than you did in the Bahamas today, and it doesn't mean you have to get jealous. You they do. even have trouble getting the camera into the case. Question now with the GoPro. Is, how do I get this into a case? <laughs> but the funniest thing is that they put the lens cap on the camera and forgot to take it off. So from that point on, there's only audio of them launching the kayaks and paddling. We are rocking and rolling with GoPro right now. Kayaking with the line offs. Let's go. <laughs> then you hear this sound. Oh no. That's the camera sinking to the bottom. So Unfortunately, sad. there's no footage of them calling the guy they borrowed the camera from. That would have been an interesting conversation. They probably told him a shark ate the camera. You know, I hope a shark ate that camera. Too bad they had the uh, lens cap on. I would have loved to have seen uh, the video of it going down to the bottom of the lake. And you can see a video on this, the video of it actually at Fish Nerds uh, podcast group on Facebook. Thanks, Tim. Next call. <laughs> Uh oh no. Oh, can't hear it. Are you down the water and the ice Oh, you're breaking up, man. We can't quite pick up the call. Let's give it a minute. I bet this is the best story we ever heard. Probably the winner for sure. If only we could hear what you were saying. I guess that might be the drawback to these call-in contests. And you, by the way, you can always record these yourself and email them to him. That's what, to me, that's what Tim did, is he sent us some good audio that he recorded himself. You certainly can do that if you have the technology, and most of you do. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you can call him in, but, you know, you can't always tell. Oh, you can't always tell the quality uh, when you do call in. And whoever this is, give us a call back for next month's contest and remind me and I'll mail you out two decals uh, because it's probably not your fault. You took, put in a good effort to get this right. Um, but wait, wait, wait. I think it's coming back. Wet clothing. And uh, and it took about an hour and a half or so to warm up. That's better. To the point where I stopped shivering. Um, but I still consider that to be my luckiest day fishing because I did have a life preserver on. It prevented my head from going under, which prevented me from gulping water. Uh, and, and I did recover my canoe and, and actually didn't lose any of my fishing equipment either. Um, and it was a strange day for me because, quite honestly, um, that was the day I found out that when you drive home in a vehicle in just your underwear, um, it's amazing how many people notice. Um, <laughs> but again, like I said, that has been my luckiest day uh, so I still feel fortunate to the fact that I didn't pay any type of stupid penalty for going out in such cold weather and rushing the season. Well, you did pay um, a penalty. By the way, I found your podcast you your on the New York Times article, and I'm glad to see that ice fishing is getting a it's due shake, finally. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I lived in Connecticut for 20 years and was fortunate to fish throughout New England, um, but now I've moved to uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, and so... I'm uh, learning how to fish the big reservoirs and, uh, and the lakes and streams uh, out west in Colorado and Wyoming. So my name is Vince. So I just started listening to your podcast, but I enjoy all things fishing. Uh, I was an aquaculture major in college many, many years ago. So I have a deep love of everything fish. And um, I am a master of nothing but an angler of fun. So um, I've enjoyed listening. Well, it sounds like our podcast is perfect for you. Thanks for calling in, and we'll get you those decals. Hello, Clay and the Fish Nerds. Hi. I'm entering the luckiest, I think, fishing story sure. that I have. <laughs> Do it. Um, Enter it. It starts off with me and my uh, one of my fishing buddies. We're going down to the lake. We're catching kokanee salmon. Ooh, and, fun. And uh, we just have lines out. We just have worms that we're catching fish with. And 
my buddy thinks I have a fish, so I start reeling it in, and it comes off. I think I snapped the line, and in the process of me reeling it in, this fish had wrapped itself around my uh, fishing buddy's line, and he was pulling up his line, and uh, the fish had tangled itself in his line, and we were able to catch the fish and uh, eat it later that day. So that's my luckiest fishing story for March. Uh, thank you, Clay and the Fish Nerds, for listening. Well, thank you. The question I have about that one is, who gets credit for catching it? If you hook a fish and you lose it, but it ends up tangled on your friend's line, who caught it? That's the magic of it. How do you know? How do you get credit? And kokanee salmon, is that like a Chinook? I'm, it must be a Western fish. I don't know that fish very well. I think they're in Washington or something. Hey, Clay, my name is Noah Leonard. I'm from Hi, Noah. Louisiana. I'm calling to enter in the Lucky Fishing Contest. You are entered. And uh, my Lucky Fishing moment was when I hooked into my uh, personal best bow on a uh, wacky rig on a jig head. And I fought him. We got him to the bank, pulled him out the water. And as soon as we got him out the water, the, uh, the hook just popped right out like it wasn't even in. So, yeah, that's my, that's my Lucky Fishing moment. Yep. And I've seen fish do that where they just hold on to the bait. They're not hooked at all. They just don't want to let go. There must be with some fish some instinct to just hang on as long as they can. I even know people who fish with no hooks on their lures because they know they can fight a fish and not hurt it. Uh, I think it's a, the vegan fishing. Maybe we'll do a vegan fishing challenge this summer. That'd be fun. Hello, Clay. This Hi. is Kevin from Omaha. Hi, Kevin. I have a story that I nearly called in for the disaster oh, no. uh, contest. It's a disaster. So every time I think about this story, I feel extremely lucky. You're well, glad. So many years ago, back when I was living in southern Colorado, I was out fishing on my little sailboat with my buddy Jake. And we're fishing back to back. Since the sailboat, there's a small area to stand in. We'd been out for a couple hours, no problem. But on one particular cast, I go to move my rod back. And at the beginning of my forward motion, I feel a snag. Oh, no. And instinctively, for a couple seconds, I'm jerking the rod around, and I hear Jake calmly say, please stop. Please stop. <laughs> <He's> so calm. <laughs> and I turn around to my horror to see my lure hanging off of my friend's face. Oh, my gosh. This is a jointed rapala with a couple of treble hooks, and it had gone over his head and whipped up and into his face about a centimeter below the edge of his eye. Oh, man, it could have been worse then. Now, if you think about how long a centimeter is, look at your eye. And I was extremely lucky that I didn't permanently damage my friend's eye. So couldn't get it out. It had actually gone in just past the bar. Mm. So we went back to the marina, couldn't get it out. The marina owner said, you guys got to go to the emergency room. That's their good choice. So we did so. And the doctors, after giving Jake several uh, muscle relaxers, we'll say, uh, <laughs> were able to actually back it out without having to punch through the other side. So uh, we went back out fishing, and it was great. Um, so always look over your shoulder lure. I still yeah. have that lure in my tackle box to this day for one because it catches fish occasionally but also as a permanent reminder to always be safe and careful when I'm fishing around other people to always know where my my rod tip is my, in my lure then I've used that to uh, teach my boys about safety so that's it thanks for listening yeah, you know, I've had similar things happen. I teach kids to fish all the time, and we always go over. Look over your shoulder before you cast. And, of course, we say that, and then we forget to do it, or we think we know stuff, and we get complacent. Next story. Hi, Clay. My name is Abe Yaffe. I live in Baltimore, Maryland. Hi, Abe. And I've got a story for the uh, calling contest. The first time I ever went fly fishing, I went to a river, uh near Baltimore that has a plaque dedicated to Lefty Cray, one of the greatest fly fishermen of all time, because uh, he lived nearby in Cockeysville, Maryland. So while I was taking a break uh, in between going up river before I went down river, I was hanging out in my car and uh, another guy pulled up and we just started chatting 
and he explained that he was Lefty Krez's grandson. And he liked to come there and hang out by the river and check out the plaque dedicated to Lefty, which was actually this occurred only a few months after Lefty had died. And uh, he pulled out of his trunk a little book called like 101 Fly Fishing Tips by Lefty Krez, and it was signed by Lefty. No way. So that was a really cool thing to happen my first time ever fly fishing. Thanks. You know, I, I'm always... What I, what I really like about not just fly fishers, but all fishers is generosity that they seem to, to have with them. They love giving stuff away, teaching stuff, showing stuff. I give lures away, books away, all kinds of stuff to people that I meet and show stuff. Um, and I think that most fishers are like that. Nice story. Hi, Clay. My name is Jay Macklin. I am a new listener to Hi, your Jay. podcast. Welcome. I'm calling from Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, real quick story I had. I do a lot of tournament bass fishing. Are you driving? Uh, one day I was fishing <laughs> a tournament, and uh, I was using a uh, Strike King crankbait, a particular type of one, and a cove. And uh, it was like a blue with a chartreuse back. I hate and, chartreuse. Uh, I got I'm myself out. hung up, the contest. and I couldn't get that bait unstuck for anything, so I wound up breaking it off. Well, lo and behold, we kept fishing the tournament, and uh, we ran to the other end of the lake. And I get to the other end of the lake. I'm fishing back in the very back of the uh, this little creek, and uh, I get hung up again. Oh, no. So I pull it in. I'm like, oh, man, I got somebody's line. I'm all tied up in somebody's line. So I pull it in, and there's that exact same crankbait that I lost five miles down the lake that I was using. I took that crankbait, tied it on, went right around to the next point, and caught my limit on that exact crankbait. And it was like mossy and green because it had been there for a while, but it was the exact same model, same color, everything. And I couldn't believe it. And I wound up coming second place in that tournament. Well, congratulations. Uh, that was a pretty cool experience. And I actually have that crankbait now on my boat keychain. And uh, <laughs> that's where it's going to stay because it's my good luck lure now. So, and I hope to hear a lot more of your podcast. They're pretty interesting. And you guys do a great job. So, have a great night. Thanks. And just a quick follow up with that. Lure, you said it's your good luck charm. You didn't go on to tell me if it actually has brought you luck going forward. Maybe it's um, maybe it's cursed. We don't know. But I love the story. Thanks for calling in, and thanks for listening. We love new listeners. Of course, we love our old listeners, too. And we're just so happy you take time for us. Yeah, my name is Tim from Hi, Iowa. Tim. Iowa. My, my luckiest fishing moment uh, years ago, I was out fishing with my father-in-law out in a lake in Minnesota. Our, our battery went dead on our boat, and he stood up with a life preserver like a sail, and we floated right up to our dock. So that was <laughs> our lucky one. You know, right. you know something about father-in-laws that don't always want to hang out with them all the time, but once in a while, uh, they got a trick up their sleeve, and that sounds like a great video, but we really slow. It sounds slow, but awesome. Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, I love your show. Thanks. I love the podcast. Oh, we love you. My name is Jim. Hi, Jim. And this story, oh my. Oh my. I used to go to Canada every September and miss the first week of school on purpose with my uncle to go fishing to catch, you know, pre-winter fish. And one night, we would go out trolling after supper, and I threw a daredevil, and it didn't even reach the water before a muskie grabbed it. It, it scared the hell out of me, literally. Uh... I mean, I was a 17-year-old kid. Turned out to be a 42-pounder that I was able to keep. And we brought it back to the dock and then let her go. This was 1977. I was four. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, it, the fish scared me more than a ghost would scare me. It was incredible. And it's something that lives to me with this, to this day. And I'll be 60 years old in june just amazing stuff anyways i do love the show thanks and that's where i'm at <laughs> it, that's my biggest memory of fishing and i fish all the time i've never been through something like that i i literally saw the fish come out of the water and grab that daredevil in 
in the air. It was about three inches above the water. I've seen that happen. Just grabbed it and said, no, you're mine. <laughs> Amazing stuff. But I do love the podcast, and I'm sus- I am uh, subscribed. Well, thank you. And uh, Anyway, guys. Yeah. Thanks, and I appreciate the show. Well, we appreciate Bye-bye. you, and I think you're a retired Marine, and we appreciate your service as well. I've had pickerel do that with um, rubber worms. I've been canoeing, and my worm was dangling, and a pickerel once jumped out of the water and was just hanging from that rubber worm. So it happens. It's a great story, though. Hey, what's up, Craig? Hi. Chris Johnson calling Hi, Chris. with uh, Luckiest Fishy Story. Uh, had the pleasure of serving the state of Maine in a sales role a few years back. In between calls, went to L.O. Bean and took a fly fishing casting course. I could uh, use one of those. And proceeded to hit up a local river near me in New Hampshire. And within 30 minutes, had caught a brown, a brookie, and a rainbow. Oh, my and, goodness. Uh, Grand Slam, from what I've been told, first time out, absolutely spoiled. Uh, since then, it has never been repeated. Yeah, well, don't even bother. Don't even try. Uh, I consider myself pretty lucky and obviously look back on that first uh, session with some fond memories. Uh, Dear Brett. Whenever I uh, whenever I have something like that happen, I just give up after that. Like if I go out fishing and I catch a giant fish, I end my trip because I'm not going to do better I, and I can't get over the excitement of it. So same game. Just don't even try. Hi, fish nerds. Hi. This is Isaac from Toma. Hi, Isaac. My lucky day fishing story is one day I went out fishing for bluegill in northern. And after I caught a bluegill, I was dropping my jig back down. I caught a suspended crappie. Nice. It was a 16-inch crappie. Big one. I believe it's my personal best to this day. And I didn't have electronics or anything, so I didn't know what depth the crappies were at. So I fished at different depths until I found the crappies again. I ended up catching 11 crappies that day, all between 14 and 16 inches. That's a good day of crappie fishing. I, I love I love crappie fishing. It seems like when you get into the big slabs, you're in them. Um, I was ice fishing the other day, and I only caught little ones. Turns out I was fishing in the wrong depth. But, man, nice job. Good story. Hello, Clay and Hi. fellow fish nerds. My name is Frank from Chino, California. Hi, Frank. I'm calling in regards to the Lucky Fish Contest. Well, thanks for calling. This actual story is not about me. I'm calling in behalf of my wife. Well, then you're disqualified. We fishing, I'm just kidding. fishing this past <laughs> Sunday out of Long Beach, California, and it was my wife's first time fishing. Awesome. And she caught a 17-inch mackerel, which Ooh. ended up being her first fish ever, and since the uh, that for that 17-inch macro, she ended up winning the big fish pot and winning the biggest fish on the boat. Wow. And that is my lucky fish story with her lucky 17-inch macro. Sounds like you're lucky to have a wife who is game to go and play and go fishing with you. That's the luckier part. Although I'm curious, you didn't tell us what was the pot. How much money did you win? I guess uh, we'll never know. Hey, Clay, this is Alex. Hi, Alex. I Alex am always a calls. I'm a time listener of your podcast. We love I'm you, Alex. Thanks. For the luckiest fishing contest. The luckiest thing that happened to me when I was fishing is when it actually wasn't me. It was my baby sister. She caught up to a bluegill at Discovery Lake, which has a bunch of them in there, but there are also pretty big bass in there. Caught up to a bluegill and the bass came up, ate the bluegill, so now she has a giant bass. It oh, was God. it came out to be eleven pounds three ounces. You're kidding. Eleven pound bass? While was, while she was reeling it in. She couldn't hold it, so I had to help her. Yeah, no choice. She had a lost balance because we were fishing on rocks at Discovery Lake San Marco. Eleven and, pounds. Yeah, biggest fish of her life. I never caught a fish that big out of that lake. To me, that's going to be her PB for a while. Forever. For me as well, that's going to be the biggest bath I'm going to see coming out of the lake for a while as well. So, yeah, thank you for making these contests, and hope I win. I hope you win, too. 11-pound bass. I've never seen one that big, so that's amazing, and you will never catch one that big. So, And she'll never repeat it. So you should just quit fishing now, because game over. Hey, Clay, this is Jared. I'm from Jared. Massachusetts. 
Wicked. I'm calling to enter this month's lucky fishing contest, right? You are entered. So, uh, I, I like going tuna fishing with my buddy, and, you know, he just bought a truck to tow his boat, and up to this point, I'd been using my truck, so lucky me, I get to go fishing. We don't have to use my vehicle to tow it. Hey, I'm happy. Or your boat. Let's go. 3 a.m. girls around, load the boat up, and we go and we leave, and we go on, on his down the road. We're going, we're going, and we're getting on Route 6, and we're going down to Marshfield. Marshfield. Up a ways, and we're going to go launch out and go tuna fishing. So everything's going swimmingly, smoothly. We're just running down the way. Well, bam, bam, sounds like a shotgun goes off, right? Well, the guy's radiator blew up. Oh, no. Me, lucky me. I'm like mechanic, so I'm just sitting there like, dude, smell antifreeze, chill out, pull to the side of the road in about two seconds, you're not going to be able to see the road. There's going to be so much steam. Mm-hmm. We're not on fire. I don't want you running down the street. We're on a highway. I don't want you running around. You're on fire, but lucky us. I don't think there's going to be much wrong with your motor. I think your radiator just blew a hole in it. You know, lucky us. Lucky. The whole story <laughs> full of luck. Pull to the side of the road. Pop it open. The whole top of the radiator blew in half. Lucky oh him, God. right? Yeah. No, lucky me. He goes, yo, I'm calling an Uber. We're going fishing. This what? sucks. Uber? <laughs> so he calls an Uber. He goes back to his house. He jumps in my truck. Uh-huh. Probably had to take, I mean... Anyway, he had to. He went back. He got, jumped in my truck. I don't know why, but I'm side on the side of the road. You know, lucky, <laughs> lucky. You should us. have been the one. The Uber. You have a whole extra truck though, so I don't care. I actually take a nap. This good, is a luck nap. Naps are always you know, good. So idea. I take a nap, and all of a sudden, I'm woken up, loud exhaust. My truck. I'm like, wow. He actually went before. You know, so he went got my truck. We hook up my truck his trailer and i don't know why he went and got it but whatever i was lucky i got to take a nap so we go down the road again we end up in last field hey lucky us <laughs> we're not the last guys at the ramp not the first guys either but we're in the middle we jump in we jump out there in the rush with everybody else because oh. it's the the parking lot starting to fill up. Like, yep. we're, if you know, lucky us, we're in, in the mob, but we <laughs> got to the front of the line. So, hey, whatever. Whatever. We launch, we get out, go tuna fishing. But first, we need to get bait. Oh, man. The whole fleet's all going to the same spot to grab bait. And I don't... Oh, you ran out of time. We'll never know what happened. <laughs> what a bummer. Sounds like a great story, though. Hello, fish nerds. This is Brian Potterbin calling from Kansas City, Missouri. Hey, Brian. Uh, just wanted to go uh, tell you about two of my lucky things uh, when it comes to fishing. I've got a hat that I got from the Grand Canyon that I've since passed down to my youngest son. And for some reason, uh, my lucky lure is rooster tails. So uh, thank you. Well, thank you for calling in, and Rooster Tales are really great. And that was the call in for the month of March. We'll have a new contest coming up in April, so stay tuned for details on that. And we really appreciate everyone calling in to the show, and we'll have decals going out this week. Since we're stuck home with coronavirus, we have time to uh, fill out envelopes and get those out to you. Hey there, Fish Nerd Nation. This is Crappie Hippie, your tree-hugging redneck from eastern Kansas. And I know I can't win the Fish Nerds contest, but gosh darn it, I still want to get in on it. I already have a bunch of glass water lures, believe it or not, and a couple of Fish Nerds hats and all that stuff. But dang it, these contests are just too fun, and fishing as long as I have, well, golly... I had to sit here and kind of reduce that uh, stock way the heck down to find the lucky fish story I'd like to tell y'all today. Um, But it goes way back to when I was a kid, and we fish out of a boat uh, around here. We call that middle seat when you fish out of the boat the grinder. And the reason we call it that is because the guy up in the bow has a whole 180 arc to fish when they to throw out and fish. And 
back in those days, most people operated or a lot of people operated the boat out of the back with a tiller handle. Uh, I mean, we're not talking a bass boat. We're talking a regular fishing boat. And so they had the tiller handle and the locator and everything was back there in the back. So sitting in the back wasn't bad because you had the trolling motor and you could see the locator and uh, which is just a flasher unit in those days. Um, and you had your 180 arc, you know, off the back of the boat and you're actually kind of controlling which way and where the boat went. So where did the kid get to sit in the middle, in the grinder, where all you get is a 45 degree pie slice because you can't be throwing over the two old guys, your dad and your dad's old buddy on the back or in the front. And you've got to sit there and be the third wheel and, and just kind of take what you get. So I spent a large portion of my fishing uh, days in my youth in the grinder but one day the grinder was the place to be and we pulled up on this old cottonwood tree and maybe it's the time of year that's making me think of this but it was pre-spawn crappie time and this uh, tree had fallen down the bank during the winter erosion or what have you and so there was a big old cottonwood and the roots was sticking out up shallow and it was laying off this uh drop off kind of at an angle so the top of it was down a little deeper and so blair the old guy we used to fish with he he thought the roots was where they were going to be and so he set himself up nice and pretty to hit them roots and my dad thought the top was where they were going to be so he was all set to give them hell and bring them out of the top and they left me with the trunk well guess what the trunk is where they all was at. And I sat there and slicked those two old farts like you wouldn't believe. My 14-year-old uh, self was ear-to-ear -ear grinning as I just pulled one crappie after another. And usually, especially old Blair, he'd, he'd beat me to like a drum. But we uh, around here have another expression called getting your foot in the bucket, which, of course, comes from farming. And you're doing chores, and you accidentally step in a bucket, and you're trying to wander around. And, well, it gets a good mental picture. But I got Blair's foot in the bucket something awful. I mean, I never seen this guy change baits in his life. He started talking to himself. He was rumbling around in the bottom of his tackle box. He caught one crappie. My dad caught six. I caught 18. So... It was about that nice brand new color called fluorescent yellow falling just perfect down the length of that stump and the crappie were suspended right there underneath that big old bowl of that tree and I caught one after one after another and it was a fantastic triumph for me. So way on back there in 1973 or 4, I put it on two old men one of the luckiest days of my life. I loved it. It was pure fun, and I still remember it to this day. This has been Crappie Hippie with my lucky fish story. Tight lines and valentines. Peace out. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's, I, need, I do need to talk about Patreon with you guys, and it's really important now more than ever. So recently... Uh, Recently, I, with a coronavirus outbreak, I've lost all of my sources of income. I don't have a job anymore. I was a bartender. I was a DJ. I had other money coming in. And with the coronavirus, I was let go from the DJ job because they're not getting any more ad revenue and the bars are all closed. So I am broke. And this podcast is being kept alive by our Patreon supporters. If you love this show and you can afford it, now is a great time to go to patreon.com slash fish nerds and give us a little money. And the way I kind of think about it in terms is if you get value out of the show, is it worth maybe a dollar twenty an episode to you? Five dollars a month, is that right? Um, maybe dollar twenty-five uh, an episode. Five bucks a month. That goes a long way to getting uh, this show paid for. Um, we have, the, you know, we have to pay hosting fees. We got to pay for equipment. We got to pay for our fancy headphones. Look, I got swag. All kinds of stuff happening. So it's really important that we pay for it. And this show is in danger of closing down now because I can't pay the difference between what we make on Patreon and what it costs to run the show. Just as an example, we have 5,000 um, people on our email list and it costs $79 a month for MailChimp to maintain that list of people and get them uh, our mailings. It's these weird charges and we have to pay for hosting from Libsyn and all kinds of other stuff. So it's not very much fun to talk about, but it's important. And if you love our show or you like our show, even if you like it, give us a few bucks and it would make a big difference to keep us going. That's patreon.com slash fish nerds. And let's see. 
people who have been giving us money. We've been getting money from uh, at five dollars a month from Alan Byrne, uh, Andrew Lewin from the Speak Up for Blue podcast gives us a few bucks a month. Andrew Dipolito gives us a little money. Uh, Bethany Met Backwards Graphics gives us money. Big Bucks Registry Podcasts pays us a little bit of money. Uh, Bradley with no last name gives us money. Brian. I'm going to say everyone's name today. So Brian Willensack, Chad O'Leary, Chander Dobson, Chris, uh, whose name I can't read the last name, E-N something, gives us some money. Cody Fondy, Courtney D, Dave Jackson from the School of Podcasting gives us $25 a month. And the deal is if you pay us $25 a month, I will name your business and say your website on the show. So Dave Jackson, schoolofpodcasting.com. And he's kind of like one of my podcasting mentors. So if you want to make a podcast, Dave Jackson's your man. David Redden uh, gives us money. Ed Hind, Fish Guy Josh, Frank Longoria, Graham Meehan, Hugo Medeiros, Jason Piper, Jeff Danielson, Joe Pardo, Super Joe Pardo, uh, Jonathan Sutter, Josh Lopes gives us $25 a month. And at that price, again, I'll say your business, Josh Lopes owns uh, lopestax.com. If you need your taxes done and you're in New England, he's your man. Josh Lopes, lopestax.com. Kevin Kupzik, like in Rancourt, Lindsey Freeman, Mark Piper, Matt Philippi, Michael Steffen, give us a buck a month. And Mike, um, who's been an old friend of the show for a long time, Michael O'Keefe, uh, Nicholas Craig, Olaf Nelson, Paul Chomo uh, gives us $2 a month from, from the Varmints, Ray Layton from England, Reed Sutter, Renegade Clock, which I think is another podcast, Rich Collins, Ryan with no last name at $5 a month, Sean Bradbury, Soju Devil, <laughs> the devil, and the Jock and Nerd podcast gives us money as well. We thank all of them and really appreciate them. Without you guys, this show would not exist. I'm working on some new rewards for it, and I'll be emailing each of you about that. So thank you so much for uh, for your money. It really makes a difference. I do want to say, though, if you are in the same boat that I am in and you've lost your income and you're giving us money, I want you to stop. I'm going to keep your money, take care of yourself. If you can afford it, help us. If you can't, you're more important than this show. Take care of yourself and your family. Patreon.com slash fish nerds. I almost forgot to announce the winner of our lucky fishing contest is da 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 da. Drum roll, please. Are you ready? Tim Beat. Tim Beat. Look for the mail. Watch the mail for your prize. If you didn't give me your address, you might want to you might want to get it to me. And uh, we're going to win some some glass water, lead free fishing lures, a fish nerd's hat, some decals, and whatever other crap I have laying around my office. We'd like to thank uh, John King, the crappie hippie, for being part of this show. Everyone who called in to the uh, Lucky Fishing Challenge, really appreciate you. And a special thanks to Wally Pleasant for our theme music and Diana's Bath Salts for our music for Fish in the News. And so until next time, follow the code of the fish nerd. Spawn early, spawn often. Never trust a free lunch with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. Just for the hell of it! Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan, eat it raw like you're in Siam, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds. It's a podcast.